Let's get started. Yee. So, second session of traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, holistic medicine, integrated medicine, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is going to be about the five elements, the four treasures, and how we put patterns together. Um, so let me just introduce myself. I'm Dr. Talia Grand. I've been a veterinarian for, I don't know, Lola, can you do math? What's 1996 minus today? I can try. Is 14. That's like 24. 24. 24. 24 years. <laughs> 14. I've been a veterinarian for 24 years, graduated Texas A&M in 1996. I have practiced pretty much strictly Western medicine up until about 2015. I took an acupuncture class, kind of fell in love with Eastern medicine, and I've been studying that for the last, I don't know, five years, I guess it's been. This is Lola, Lola Rojas. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Lola. Um, as Dr. Grant has already said, if you joined us before, By the I way, she's recently- she's Dr. Rojas. <laughs> yeah, I recently graduated vet school, and um, Dr. Grant kind of took me under her wing and is just teaching me while I go through the licensing process. So this is one of the fun things I get to do as part of that. So she's going to be our co-host today. She's going to monitor the chat and she's going to break in. So if you guys have any questions, um, there's a chat list. I think, uh, do you want to walk them through that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you see on the bottom of your screen, if you have Zoom in, in full screen, you should see where it says chat or questions. So you can actually ask a question and it will alert me that you've asked one. Or we can just use the chat. You can ask your question and I'll let Dr. Grand know and whatever she's talking about and we can, we can, we can get that done. So this is kind of interactive. Obviously, we're the only two talking, but Lola knows what I'm talking about, so she'll kind of break in. If you guys have any questions along the way, I'll be happy to answer them. So we're going to start off with why patterns matter. We're going to go over excess and deficiency. Um, if you weren't here for our first session, you may want to go and review that. We're going to go through that pretty quickly. We're going to talk about the five elements, the four treasures. We're going to put it all together. We're going to do one example case, and then we'll take some questions. So patterns, as I mentioned in the previous and the first seminar, patterns are like diagnosis in Eastern medicine. They are basically the way we figure out what to treat. And so patterns are really important because if we have the wrong pattern, we're gonna pick the wrong treatment. Just like in Western medicine, if you have the wrong diagnosis, you're gonna pick the wrong treatment. If you can't determine a pattern or a diagnosis, you can't treat it because we have to have kind of a cause of what's happening and how we can fix this. So they're similar to diagnosis, but really what patterns do is it, is it identifies imbalances in the body. So even in Western medicine, when we don't have a diagnosis, but we have a lot of imbalances, we can treat even without a diagnosis. So it's a little bit more powerful, I think, than Western medicine in that case, because it's not always one-to-one -one, and there's not always something specifically, a disease process wrong with the dog. It may just be an imbalance or cat um, or horse or pig or goat or whatever we're treating. So once we figure out the pattern, we can target our therapy and we can focus it on what's going on. We can balance we can get things working again, basically. And we can also, and this is pretty pretty powerful stuff, we can predict future disease. Um, not always, not to a great degree, but better than Western medicine. So let's figure out how that works. So first, I introduced you to excess versus deficiency in our first seminar. Too much of something is excess. It is August, it's 110 degrees, it's Texas, it's hot. It is excess. It's excess heat. But you can also be too hot and be deficient. Now, the classic example of that is having a broken air conditioner. And the classic example of that is menopause. For example, if you're deficient in your yin, and we'll talk about that, it's one of the four treasures, your yin is your internal air conditioner, you can still be hot and have hot flashes because your air conditioner is broken. It has nothing to do with your external heat source. It has to do with your internal way of, of cooling or balancing out that cool and hot. Now, the thing is, is it's pretty easy to treat excesses. 
you just clear them, you jump in a swimming pool, you go inside, you have a fan on you, you have an air conditioner on you. Unfortunately, you can't do the same thing with a deficient heat because trust me, if you throw a menopausal woman into a swimming pool, you're going to get a really mad woman and she's going to be hot, wet and mad and that's not something you want to see. So with deficiencies, we have to tonify the deficiency to get that internal air conditioner working again. So that's kind of the differences between excess and deficiencies. So let's talk about the five elements. And this is pretty cool. So most people will know four elements. Um, Lola, help me out here. The four elements, because I've known five for so long. It's um, earth. Water, wind, earth, and fire, I think yes, is what we yes. consider them. So we're going to start with fire. That's an element. We're going to go with earth. It's an element. We're going to go with metal. There's no wind, water, which is an element, and we're gonna go with wood. So these interrelate sort of like a, well, these are a nourishing pattern. They're all present no matter what you're doing. And the Chinese say that each element nourishes the other. For example, wood feeds a fire. Fire, the ashes of which feed the earth. Earth creates metals and ores in its belly. Metal nourishes and mineralizes water. Water feeds the roots, which grow the wood. So it's a very cyclic kind of um, philosophy that these elements all work together. And they're called what, I, what we call a mother-child relationship, where the wood is the mother of fire, fire is the mother of earth, earth is the mother of metal, metal is the mother of water and they're nourishing to each other and they live in a cycle and you could see the cycle in life where wood would be um, babies toddlers wood new growth springing up fire um the teenage years they're very fiery well mine weren't but i'm an introvert so you know most people <laughs> were fiery but was your were probably fiery i was fiery <laughs> <laughs> um Earth is more the reproductive years, the, um, the, the parenting years, the settling down and figuring things out years. Metal is more of your um, empty nester years. You've got things fiddled, figured out. Um, it's just kind of, you know, when you're just enjoying life. Water is your geriatric years and your geriatric years end that feed into new life and new growth. You can also look at this in the seasons. Um, you can say wood is springtime, fire is summertime, earth is harvest time, so late summer, metal is fall, water is winter. So all of these are very cyclical, not only in, um, in nature, in, but they are cyclical and they relate to each other in personalities too. And we'll go over that in a second. There's something that we can call a control cycle, where in ancient China, it wasn't the mom that uh, controlled the child. It was the grandmother, because mom was off working, so the grandmother took care of the child. The grandmother controlled the child. So if we look at it, fire can melt metal. So fire controls metal. Metal can chop wood, and it can make it, you know, just kind of chop it down. Wood can bind the earth with its roots and, and, and really hold the earth to where it, earth doesn't really necessarily want to be. Earth can muddy or divert water and water puts out fire. So that's what we call a nourishing cycle on the outside and a control cycle on the inside. And that gets all of our in elements interrelating with each other in very different ways. If we look at this according to personality types, Every being, and this, this goes to plants, this goes to crystals, this goes to humans, this goes to dogs and cats. We are all, all five elements, but our basic personality type lives in one or two of those elements. So they, we call them constitutions. So let's talk about the fire element. Fire element constitutions, personalities are happy, they're up, they're lively, they're playful, they're vocal, they're the center of attention. They're divas, they're extroverts, they are what we call the emperor, the kings, they're really the center of attention. So if we look at dogs specifically, 
we have bred dogs to be of a certain personality type and you can really take a lot of breeds and put them in an element. So Lola, what would be an example of a fire breed? Our golden retrievers. Golden for sure. retrievers, yeah. And they tend to be the color too. They, the fire dogs tend to be red. So poodles, they're up, they're crazy, they're vocal, they're loud, they're playful. Now, one that's not red is like a Jack Russell. They're up and bouncy, they're, they're just, I mean, they're all over the place. So let's look at the earth personalities. Um, relaxed, friendly, steady, solid, good appetites, they love food. Um, they are called the mother. So Lola, breed of, of earth types? Ideally labs. Labs, labs yeah, I think, I think labs have gotten to where they're more fire than earth these days, but I, I, re I remember labs when they were all just kind of laid back. Mastiffs okay. certainly are very earth. They're very solid and big and large. Um, so basset hounds, they're low to the ground, again, solid. They, they, these earth dogs, I mean, they're, they're wonderful creatures because they are just the sweetest, most couch potato dog you've ever met. So let's talk about metal because a lot of people don't really understand the metal element. Metal elements love order. They are your OCD, your type A personalities. They're your rule followers. They tend to be a little bit more aloof and quiet, a little bit more on the introverted side. They're very independent and they're kind of known as the organizer, the prime minister. They tend to run things behind the show. So breeds of this, Pitch and Lola, um, Border Collies. Border Collies, yeah. yeah. Um... A lot of cats fall into metal personalities. I think they're very aloof and and, and very persists persnickety they tend to be very shebas huh shebas can be maybe yeah, a shiba, shiba inu Inus those can be metal, metal. <laughs> um but they're they're just very kind of aloof creatures they're going to be the ones who aren't sleeping on top of you like the fire dogs or cuddled up next to you like the earth dogs they're going to be in the same bed but they're going to be down at the end making sure you stay exactly where you're supposed to stay and they're going to let you know when you don't so the water element, these are the observers, the philosophers, they're careful, they're very introverted. These are the true, true invert, introverts. They're timid, they tend to be shy, they tend to love one person, one, maybe two, but really they probably tolerate one and they tend to love their one person and they tend to run away and hide. Um, I wouldn't call them not friendly. They're very friendly to their one person, they just aren't really they don't care to be involved in anyone else. And, and a breed that really categorizes this is chihuahuas, um, okay. because you see that one chihuahua with that one person that really doesn't like anybody else. <laughs> now wood, that's another element that most people really aren't familiar with. These are your confident, aggressive, dominant breeds. These are Rottweilers, these are Dobermans, these are German Dobermans, Shepherds. Yeah. They're dominant, they're athletes. Um, um, you can have woods as, as greyhounds. Um, they run the show. They are, and they can fall into aggression, but that's usually an imbalance. Um, usually they're just assertive. They just know exactly who they are, what they are, and what they want. And so all of these elements, and you can kind of see if you have say a wood dog and an earth dog, how the wood dog is going to be the boss and the earth dog is going to sit there and say, whatever you say. If you have a wood dog and a fire dog, the, f the wood is going to try to nurture the fire. And so they kind of get along. But what if you have a wood and a metal? Well, metal tries to control the wood and woods don't like it. So you've got a little bit of headbutting going on there. It's not like they can't get along, but they're more likely to not get along than others. So we call these patterns of behavior. We call them constitutions. We really classify our patients and our breeds into different, different constitutions because that leads us to disease later. And the Chinese say that a balance of all of these elements and you're healthy, um, happy, healthy. If you have imbalance, um, then you get disease. And I think um, going off of that too, um, you can have two breeds. Could you have two breeds of the same dog and have two totally different elements? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And another thing we can see, let me get down here and make some, see if I can do some annotations. So we can have 
a fire, two fire dogs together, um, playful, happy, active, kind of get into little tips now and then, but they're sensitive. They get over it fairly quickly. But you can also have animals that are kind of like right here that are kind of in between fire and earth. Sometimes in some situations they're very earthy, some situations they're very fi fiery. So you can kind of have a dog that sits in between or that leans more towards one or the other. And so definitely you're gonna have at least one or two of these elements combined. You almost never have the opposite. That just doesn't work. It's usually two next to each other or one predominant. Did that answer? Question? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. So why do we care about these elements? Why do we care about personalities? Because they go directly into our acupuncture meridians and our organ systems. So the fire element is, is associated with the heart and the actual heart. The uh, earth element is associated with the spleen meridian. Now in Chinese medicine, the spleen meridian is the GI tract. Um, not just the actual organ spleen, it's the, it's the GI tract and how it works. Metal element, um, lung organ. Water element, kidney organ. Uh, wood element, liver organ. So they all interrelate. And you can correlate the different elements with different diseases. For example, the fire element or the heart element, you can have heart disease, but you can also have the heart houses the shen, the mind, the behavior, the emotions. So in the heart element, you can also have anxiety, you can have behavior problems, you can have, um, uh, what am, what's the word I'm looking for, Lola? I can't, I can't think of it right now. Anyway, anxiety, behavior problems, um, fear, aggression, um, you can have uh, thunderstorm phobias and things like that, fearful behavior. Earth, you're gonna have pretty much GI disorders, they're very steady. They don't get a whole lot of, of really other diseases, but GI diseases can be big. If any of you have an animal with GI disease knows, it can kind of take over your life. The metal get respiratory mm -hmm. disorders because that's associated with lung. The kidney is a little bit more involved because the kidney being an old age deep element also controls deep bones in the spinal cord. So arthritis is associated with the kidney element. Kidney disease is associated with the kidney element. Hearing loss, graying hair is associated with the kidney element. Now, the thing about the kidney element, remember I said that's kind of the geriatric years. That's why we see a whole lot of these diseases when animals and people get old because it's the last element to go. It's usually the element that holds on the longest. Um, the wood element, you usually get liver diseases. You can have seizures, um, the liver controls wind, which is seizures. You can have tendon and ligament disease, which is interesting. When I first started learning this, we see a lot of ruptured cruciates, which is a tendon in the knee. We see it a lot in Rottweilers and um, Dobermans and these woody kind of very athletic breeds. And we used to say, well, it's because they're athletes. Then we proved it really has to do with their ligaments and not necessarily um, their activity level. And so, but why are they getting these? It's because their liver element's unbalanced. Um, we can also see stress. This is where stress lives. We call it liver chi stagnation. And liver chi stagnation is real. Um, and especially now, nowadays when you get stress, your liver is just doing this. Now watch this. Liver over controls the spleen, right? So cool. What happens when you get liver chi stagnation? You get liver over controlling the spleen and you get GI disease. How many of you have your animals when they're stressed, they get diarrhea, they get an upset stomach or people, I do. Um, when you get stressed, your stomach gets upset. It's directly because of that relationship and we can start making clues as to how to treat it because typically what we're gonna do is treat the diarrhea, but we're not treating the stress. So what if we could do both? And it starts getting really powerful as far as what you can focus in your treatment on. So now let's move on to the four treasures. So four treasures for yin and yang, chi and blood. So yin and yang kind of work together. We're gonna to go over that first. Chi and blood work together. We're gonna to go over that second. It is not yin and yang, it is yin and yang. 
you can say it however you want to, but this is how the Chinese do it. So we've got our nice little balance symbol. And if you notice, yin is your dark. Your dark and your light go together, but you have yin within your yang and yang within your yin. So it's really kind of an infinite loop, but your yin is your cool, it's your internal air conditioner, it's dark, it's down, it's old, it's at the end of life, not the beginning of life. It's negative, it's passive. There are philosophical ways of looking at yin. There are medical ways of looking at yin. Um, the medical way is that the dog is too hot because the yin is supposed to cool you down and it doesn't. So then you get yang rising, which is warmth. So hot flash. So light bulbs, hopefully you're going off seeing how these should interrelate in your body. Young is light up, warmth, heat, it's young. All young dogs are young, they're up, they're, you know, young starts the day, everything rises, yin is nighttime, everything falls, you've got this nice biorhythm. Um, and so these have to be in balance. Now you can have too little of both, you can have too much of one, too little of one, you can have all different variations on how these are in balance. But keeping them balanced means you're disease-free. So, sorry, I have a phone call. Nobody. Let's talk about <laughs> chi. There are many different types of chi. We're just going to talk about kind of general chi. Chi is energy, function, and movement. So it's whatever is working in your body. Your kidneys are working. Your heart is pumping. Your muscles are moving. Your tendons are moving. Your brain is thinking. My brain is thinking too much sometimes. It's the neurologic synapses. It's everything in your body that's moving and functioning together to get you to live. It's life. It's, it's just everything working together. It's your chi. When you don't have chi, you don't have energy your chi is low or deficient. There's really not, not too much chi. You can never have too much chi. That just doesn't work. But you can definitely be chi deficient. Um, let's talk about blood. And blood is not just the stuff flowing through your veins. It is riblet cells. It is also immunoglobulins, which that is. It's also the protein in the cells. Let me go back to that. It's the proteins in the cells. It's electrolytes. It's everything in the body fluids that flow through your body and bathe your cells so that your chi can work. So these things have to work together. And the Chinese say that chi and blood work together like a boat on water. So chi is the boat with the motor. So chi gets the boat moving and blood is the water. If you have chi or if you have water, blood, but no chi, your boat's gonna be still because you don't have an engine to move it. If you have an engine, but no water, your boat's still not going to move. You have to have a balance of both or things don't work right. And hopefully you've got both and you can sail off into infinity in a beautiful yacht. That would be nice. But really what it needs is, is both. So sometimes you have not enough cheese, sometimes you have not enough blood, and sometimes they just you don't have enough of either and nothing works. So you've got to balance these things out in order to be able to function correctly. So let's put it all together. So we have excess versus deficiency, and we have our four treasures, and we have our five elements. So we're going to talk a little bit first about the eight principles, which eight principles takes our excess versus deficiency. Um, I'm not, you know, because it's, it's, I never could find eight in this with, with the, the classes they gave us. We've got the four treasures. We have excess deficiency. We have pathogens and secondary pathogens. I guess that's eight. Chinese come up with addition. I, I don't know how they do it, but we do have excess versus deficiency. Our pathogens are something called wind, cold, heat, fire, summer, damp, dryness. These are really the main pathogens in Chinese medicine. Our secondary pathogens are chi stagnation, blood stagnation, phlegm stasis, and food stasis. Um, just go over these slightly. 
when I talked in the first seminar, I equated heat and fire with inflammation, cold as viruses, wind as itching, um, damp as infections. That still holds true. Those are, are kind of a one-to-one -one correlation with, with the excess patterns that we see in Chinese medicine. Secondary pathogens, qi stagnation is pain. Um, when qi doesn't flow, this is when I use that analogy that if you've got a traffic jam on like North, Tal North, uh, the North Dallas North Tollway, Dallas North Tollway, <laughs> the Dallas North Tollway, you've got a wreck, traffic is backed up, qi is not moving, you've got stagnation, you've got road rage, you've got heat, you've got inflammation, you've got pain. So that's what qi stagnation is. Anytime you have qi that's not moving, it's called qi stagnation. Blood stagnation is a bruise. Um, it's when blood physically is not moving. So you can, I mean, the easy way of seeing that is a bruise. Um, if you're bleeding out the tissues and, and chi stagnation, blood stagnation often go together. Phlegm and stasis, and I alluded to this in the first seminar too, is cancer. It is any conglomeration of cells that should not be in your body. So it's a mass, it's tumor, it's also pregnancy. Not that those shouldn't be in your body, but they should be there only temporarily and leave as opposed to staying there forever. It's also phlegm, the stuff you cough up, you know, it's actual phlegm, but really is a conglomeration of sticky stuff that's stuck in your body. Um, food stasis is, you know, food stasis. It's bloat, it's eating too much and food just won't move down. So it mostly comes back up. And then we have our four treasures, and typically we define those as, opposed, as to deficiencies as opposed to excesses, because it's really hard to have four treasures in excess. It's usually mostly our bodies are deficient in them. So then we take our zongfu, our meridians, our systems, our elements, our heart, spleen, lung, kidney. We take our excess and deficiencies and our treasures, and we put it all together into a pattern. Let's do that with freckles. We went over freckles in the first seminar. She's my dog. Um, she lived 17 and a half years. So when she turned 12, 13 years old, she was coughing, she was arthritic. She couldn't jump up on the couch anymore. She was getting weak in her back end. She was getting deaf. Um, she was old. Old age is not a disease. Old age brings diseases and brings debilitation, but it is not a disease in and of itself. So Western wise, I could have given her a cough suppressant, I could have given pain control, but I'm not actually helping out her deficiencies in this. So let's just take freckles and say she has chronic bronchitis, she has chronic arthritis, back pain, she has degenerative myelopathy, which is um, muscle degeneration, and her nerves aren't working as well. So that's what causes weakness. And then of course she's deaf. So how do we put this together in her? Well, she's coughing, so it's the lung. Um, old age and arthritis goes with the kidneys. So we've picked our meridians, we've got two of these. We can't have more, sometimes we have one, sometimes we have two, sometimes we have more. Um, does she have an excess? Yes. She's got pain, so she's got qi stagnation, and she has this cough, this phlegmy kind of cough, so she's got phlegm in her lungs. Is she deficient? Absolutely. She's got a qi deficiency, and this is the degeneration of muscles and nerves. She also has a yin deficiency, and now how did I recognize that? Yin deficiencies, um, they're hot, remember? So she was sleeping on my uh, wood floors instead of her bed, where normally she sleep on her bed. She was panting even if we hadn't been outside, even when it was winter. Um, she was seeking cool spots. Her tongue was red, her pulses were fast. Um, so basically physical exam wise told me she was yin deficient. She was running too hot, but she was also very chi deficient. So she had all of these things. So her pattern is lung chi and yin deficiency, kidney chi and yin deficiency, chi stagnation in the back and hips, and phlegm in the lungs. So that's how we put it all together. We have a Western diagnosis of bronchitis, arthritis, degenerative disease, which in, in Western medicine, there's nothing we can do about degenerative disease. The chronic bronchitis, again, I can suppress um, with pain, I can suppress pain, but I really can't tonify any of this. So how do we treat her? Well, 
there's acupuncture points that tonify lung qi and lung yin specifically. There's acupuncture points that tonify kidney qi and kidney yin. There's acupuncture points that clear stagnation. There's acupuncture points that clear phlegm. So I basically did all these points in her to tonify her deficiencies, to balance out her yin and yang, to give her more qi, to clear her pain, and to clear the phlegm in her lungs. Now, most people, when they see acupuncture, they think this, that acupuncture is just for pain. You have hip pain, go get acupuncture, hip pain goes away. You have back pain, go get acupuncture, back pain goes away, which is true. Very, very true. However, you can see all of these other things that it does too. And it's a lot more powerful than just a pain treatment. It is as effective as morphine in treating pain without side effects, without long-term effects, without addiction. It is absolutely wonderful at treating pain. But what if, what if you can make that kidney meridian work better so the chi doesn't stagnate so you don't have pain? What happens if on the North Dallas Tollway, you can fix the road so you don't have backups, so you don't get stagnation? Much more powerful. So acupuncture does this. We put needles in. We talked about um, acupuncture in our first session where we can do aqua acupuncture, inject B12 or saline. We can do electroacupuncture. Uh, we can do dry needling. We've got all sorts of acupuncture treatments. We can treat her with herbs. There are herbs that focus specifically on lung chi and yin, kidney chi and yin, stagnation, phlegm. There's all sorts of herbs that we can use that help tonify. Now, the good thing about herbs is that dogs really don't like acupuncture. They don't like coming to me every twice a week or once a week and getting stuck with needles. So the herbs can do a lot of the heavy lifting. They can actually do a lot in between our acupuncture sessions. So think of acupuncture as getting things moving and the herbs as continuing the movement. So Freckles was on Breathe Easy B, hindquarter weakness. She was occasionally on body sore because remember, I'm tonifying her kidneys. So her pain actually went away. And it only came about when she was playing or running and she probably shouldn't have, just like us when we get older, we have those times when we just work a little too hard and we get a little stiff and sore and we need something for our pain. But mostly she didn't need it. I did not treat her for phlegm in the lungs because her cough went away once I tonified her lungs. She really wasn't coughing anymore. So I did no herbs for the cough um, because she didn't need it. So the other way we can treat in Eastern medicine is food. Foods have action, foods have temperatures, foods can cool you down, warm you up, and foods can tonify qi and yin and yang and blood. So I picked foods that focus to her pattern. So these are some of the foods I picked and put together in a stew so that she could eat to kind of help balance everything out. Um, and yes, I did cook this food. I think food is a very big um, seminar all on its own. So I'm not gonna really talk about it now. We'll probably answer some questions because everybody always asks about food. I want our next seminar to be about food. So hopefully I'll come back and see that. Um, but for right now, we're just going to kind of touch that food has the same exact actions that acupuncture and herbs do. It's not as strong. It's not as potent, but definitely it gives you a little boost. And if you start eating the things you're supposed to eat, you can balance yourself out a little bit. Tweena is massage. Freckles is a metal dog who is very particular and one of her particular things is she didn't like being touched. So massage was out for her. I could not do massage. Some dogs love it. Earth dogs love it. Fire dogs to some extent. Wood dogs really good at massage except for people they don't like. Um, and definitely the water dogs absolutely adore massage from their people. But metal dogs can like massage or not like it. And Freckles was a very picky dog. And if you started touching her, she would either turn around and try to bite you or she'd just leave the room. So unfortunately, Tweena, which is massage therapy, was not part of her treatment program at all because she said no. She just said no. So if we can treat 
who they are, if we can figure out their constitution, if we can figure out their pattern, we can focus our therapies to tonify deficiencies, to clear excess, and using Western medicine a lot to clear excess, we can get them balanced. This is Buckshot. At nine months old, he developed steroid responsive meningitis, which is an autoimmune disease where the immune system is attacking their brain. He tried to die on us. We used Western medicine to suppress his immune system. We used Eastern medicine to tonify his deficiencies because he started losing weight, losing energy, um, vomiting, diarrhea. He had a sensitive stomach. He was, he was just pale. He was anemic. So we used blood tonics. We used chi tonics. We used herbs. We used acupuncture. We used food. We used everything to balance him out while we're suppressing his immune system to not only get him through therapy, but to get him off the therapy and onto regular life. He is now two years old. He's completely clear of all symptoms and off all Western medications. We can treat cancer. We went over Gus in our last segment where Gus had hemangiosarcoma, which is a tumor in the spleen. So we basically tonified his chi, his Wei chi specifically, which was his immune system to keep him as energetic and his immune system as healthy as possible. We attacked the cancer with herbs to try and build that fence so that the bad neighbor, which is our cancer, can't climb over the fence and bother us. Um, he was given Western medicine without surgery, gave him days to a couple weeks to live. He lived for 12 more months at a good quality of life. Kima, I loved Kima. Now, Kima literally by the um, veterinary oncologist was given two days, two days. She had cancer in her lungs. She was coughing up blood. She had these such large amounts of tumor in, in, in her lungs that she could barely breathe. She was weak. She could have barely get up. She was not eating. Um, and when she came to see me, all I did was acupuncture and herbs. And within a week, she was not coughing and she was pulling them on walks. And this was a couple weeks. This picture was taken a couple weeks after I saw her. She was starting to eat and we gave her a, a we tip, uh, fortified a diet or we- uh, Balanced. We, like well, we mineral calcium it. balance? We formulated a diet specifically for her and her cancer that would help her fight it. Um, she lived only three months. And I say only when you're given two days to live and it's a bad two days and you live for three months where she was eating, going on walks, happy, active, playful, not coughing. That's a long time. And especially in dog years, that three months is like me giving a human about a year to live when you might have had a couple weeks and not just not just living it's 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 enjoying life it's a quality of life versus just being alive so Heidi had a ruptured cruciate. Um, we tonified her liver meridian, tendons and ligaments. We gave her herbs to help with the pain and to help those tendons heal and moisturize and get nice and 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 lubricated again. Um, this is I believe that's Lucy and I don't think Lucy ate xylitol. And um, we did use some acupuncture on her. We didn't do a whole lot of herbs because mostly it was about supporting her Western wise. So we really didn't use a whole lot of Eastern medicine. She ate a big uh, pack of sugar-free gum and got toxic from it. So we used Eastern medicine to help her through that. Um, Bailey also had cancer in her mouth. She lived for six months, happy, active, playful. Um, this, this tumor was up in her, the back of her mouth. She was, had nosebleeds before I saw her, but this is a couple days you know, after I saw her and she was doing great for a long time. This ninja, um, if you're interested on my YouTube channel, there's a video of ninja. He was a puppy that was found with a broken back and we got him walking again with acupuncture. Um, we did use herbs and acupuncture on him. We did use diet. We used everything combined. We didn't, we used um, tween on him. He really liked massage. So hopefully if we figure out what's wrong, we can balance it and fix it. But the key here is the pattern. The key here is figuring out what is wrong. But what if we could not just take what's wrong, but what if we could predict what's going to go wrong? What if we can take an animal 
knowing their constitution, knowing those metal constitutions are going to have lung disease, those earth constitutions are going to have GI disease. What if we know those fire constitutions are gonna have heart disease? What if we can tailor their diets and, 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 and how we treat them medically? What if we can predict their outcome based on who they are? That would be extremely powerful. We can start off when they're babies and we can start feeding them to their personality. We can start using acupuncture early. We can take Rottweiler puppies and hopefully prevent ruptured cruciates. We can take poodles and goldens and hopefully prevent heart disease. We can, we can prevent all of these diseases if we treat them like they're supposed to, because right now, most of us being humans and most of our pets are imbalanced. We don't eat right. We don't exercise. We don't meditate. We don't use what we have innately and keep it in such a balance that we don't get off in disease. So what if we can? I think it'd be pretty powerful and I really like to start with these guys young and start them off on a food program that's tailored to them as individuals because every single face you see on this screen is a different animal, much different. One does not equal the other. One needs to eat cucumbers, one needs to eat liver, one needs to eat chicken, one needs to eat turkey. It's very individualized acupuncture, one needs to tonify the lung meridian because they're a metal personality. One needs to tonify the liver meridian because they're a, a, a wood personality. It's pretty powerful stuff. So I think that's it. Um, I'm going to basically open it up for questions. If, you, if you're on the chat, if you hit two all panelists, we are the only ones that will be able to see a question. So. Um, we can answer anything there as soon as you guys have questions. Do you have any questions, Lola? I know you've heard this forever. Yeah. Um, I think I, let's see, uh, maybe a, a common one that we get a lot is if you put my dog on an herb, is that something that he's going to stay on long term? If, for example, in the, in, in the case where you say if we treat them or we start treating them young based on, on their constitution, based on their elements? Will they be on that herb? Will they change? That kind of thing. Um, and the answer you're going to hear me say this a lot is it depends. It depends. Sometimes when we get an animal in that is older and sicker and has been unbalanced for a long time, it's treating patterns is like peeling an onion where we see one pattern, we fix it and uncover a second pattern. We fix that and uncover a third pattern. Certainly freckles over her life um, was on one herb, switched to another herb, and then kind of balanced them both several different times. And a lot of it depended on the season too, because yin deficiencies tended to show up more in the fall when yin was supposed to kick in than it did when yang was present and in the spring. So some are seasonal, some um, are, we just have a lot of layers of imbalances that we have to uncover before we can get to the meat of the issue. Most older patients who have been imbalanced for a long, long time are gonna be on at least one, if not two herbs long-term because they can't balance themselves. It's been too long. They can't get quite back there on their own. Um, but some we can take off herbs. Some will need to switch based on season. Some will need to switch based on their patterns. Certainly during the time when Freckles, the four years, she had an issue with UTI, uh, urinary tract infection. She had an issue with something called old dog vestibular disease. So I took her off one herb, or put her on another until I fixed that problem, got her back balanced, put her back on the original herbs. So it really depends on the dog. Um, a lot of these older ones, I would say the answer is yes, they're going to be in, on herbs pretty much forever, but they've been in balance for eight, nine, ten years. So you kind of have to realize that they're going to need to be have artificial balancing because they can't do it themselves. 
Whereas if we start as puppies, will we need to? And I don't know the answer to that. I really don't know. Okay. We do have a question about how long you estimate a large breed lifespan could be. So it's pretty typical that um, large giant breeds live about eight years. The large breeds live uh, eight to uh, 10, 11, 12. The medium breeds 10 to 13. The smaller breeds can go up into their mid to late teens. Um, and toy breeds even longer. So there's definitely a correlation between sizes where the size of the breed lives longer than the, the larger the breed lives shorter. Having said that, if, if you look at our, our gene, which is uh, another treasure out there that we didn't really talk about, but that's basically your, your essence, what you're born with, your life energy. And if you look at it like a candle, you're born with so much. You can only add to the bottom of that waxy candle with food, healthy living, good breathing. Um, you, you can only add to that if you're eating well. You take away from that candle, the worse you live. Now, if you live really well, you can kind of balance it out to where you're adding and taking away at the same rate so your wax doesn't decrease. But all candles, all life is going to deplenish at some point. We're not made to live forever. So we're, we're going to degenerate, deteriorate, become deficient over time. But how balanced and how big can you keep that candle? And I think in Chinese medicine, the answer is longer than if you don't use Chinese medicine. Because again, um, Eastern medicine is about tonifying. It's about adding to the bottom of the candle and utilizing that wax as good as possible rather than just stopping it from burning, which is what Western medicine does. And Western medicine doesn't only just stop it from burning, but in some cases, especially when you're on chronic long-term medications, can burn it faster. We do also have another question, Dr. Grant, about what factors could prevent possible dog aggression. Um, and I think she wanted to relate it with elements too, like if there are some types that are more likely to be aggressive or just fire or just wood, um, if there's... I would say the three breeds that don't necessarily always mix well is the wood elements, the fire elements, and the metal elements. They tend to be your most irritable. Um, when they're in balance, they tend to kind of lash out. Now the fire ones, that's the anger that kind of flames up and goes away. The metal ones are the ones that are going to, you know, simmer and be a little bit more calculating. Resentful. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry. Resentful. Yeah. They're going to hold grudges. Yeah. And the wood is going to be just in your face, get, change, do this. So yes, in some ways you can predict if you get two wood dogs or a fire to wood, you may have more problems. Earth dogs get along with everybody and the water elements are going to run from everybody. So they're going to be easier to get along with. So if you can predict elements, I would kind of mix ones that are complementary, but that isn't always the case. It, it's just so very hard to predict. In any element, you can imbalance into a different element differently than the same element. So if you're a metal element, a lot of times if you're unbalanced and stressed, you go straight to the wood element, you get aggressive. But some metal elements will run away and be shy and introverted and turtle and suppress. And those would be most more likely to get along with another aggressive breed than the metal element that is going to fly off the handle and get in your face. So it's very difficult to predict personality conflicts. Um, but you can see almost in hindsight why two animals don't get along because you've got two elements that just basically are conflicting. Are there, are there any factors that could prevent even just dog aggression? Um, it depends. Balanced environment, a lot of dog aggression is due to stress and anxiety. And if you can decrease that stress and anxiety, a lot of times you can head off aggression. Um, so it kind of depends on the source. Is, is, is it an environmental source? Is it an innate personality source? 
Um, is it a fearful source? Is it a, a irritable source? There's just so many interrelated type patterns that it could be. And, and you just kind of have to figure it out which pattern it is so you can kind of head it off at the pass. And you, you can't, that's something that's really difficult to predict because there's just too many moving parts. Okay. We do have a great question about kind of everything that's going on right now. Allison wants to know if because of COVID-19, if we are taking new TCVM patients, she has a, a staffy with some issues that she'd like to get in. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, certainly if it's an urgent patient, like uh, one that's sick, has cancer, um, really it's, a, it's, it's, it's an urgent, just like you would go to the doctor for, we're taking in new TCVM patients. If it's something that's been going on for a long time, we're trying to put it off until we can reopen our clinic. It's really much easier for me with these patients to talk to people face to face and explain what I'm doing for you to watch the acupuncture, for me to kind of go over the herbs. We've got handouts with food. We talk about diet and, and what to feed them. And it's really difficult to do that over the phone um, when you're in the parking lot and I'm in here or FaceTime and you're at home and, and, and we're in here. So urgent cases, yes, we will see them. If your dog was just diagnosed with cancer, please come see us. If you're dealing with arthritis or coughing that's been going on for months to years, then try to put it off. Um, you'll, I think you will get more out of it. The dog will probably still be accessible, but you quite won't understand exactly what we're doing. And it, it's, it's hard to make that connection and see what we're doing. So I do recommend putting that off if you can until we open the clinic. And hopefully um, we'll start opening. And we've always been not a full volume. We don't have four rooms going at once. We have one or two go rooms going at once. So hopefully when we open, we're going to open pretty much the way we did before, where you're taken straight into an exam room. There's no hanging out at the lobby with other people. Um, it's you, me, your pet, and maybe one other uh, technician in the room um, talking and sharing. And so I I'm pretty sure that'll be pretty safe. Yeah. And just to add on to that too, that the appointments that Dr. Grand does in there are, are anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. It is a long amount of time that we spend in there. So you can get a lot more out of those when it is in person. You can be asking all the questions as Dr. Grand is telling you all the information. And it is a lot of information that that um, she gives. And it really that. is a conversation because every single appointment is different. Every single appointment is treated as that unique individual. And so it's got to be a conversation between you and me. I ask all sorts of questions about their history. Where do they sleep? How do they act towards strangers? I really need to get an idea of who they are so I can tailor their treatment and therapy. Um, is there anything we can do, for example, if based on this present presentation, we were able to maybe pinpoint, I think my dog has some kind of liver cheese stagnation. Is there anything that can be done at home meanwhile or any kind of exercises, things like that? Apple cider vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> So vinegar is a really potent cheese mover. And you guys have probably seen on the news, you know, to take a shot of apple cider vinegar a day and it'll, it'll help stress levels. It helps you feel better. It really only helps you feel better. It helps those wood, those liver cheese stagnation uh, people and pets. Uh, the problem is, is giving a, your dog a shot of apple cider vinegar. They are not going to appreciate it. But if you could <laughs> cook a little bit of vinegar in with maybe, um, what's a good liver food? Beef? Um, I would get a lean beef because uh, uh, chicken is too hot. Um, beef is, and, and liver, if you can make a little bit of uh, beef liver with some turkey and maybe some chicken liver with a little bit of vinegar in it. Uh, vinegar is a great cheese mover. Uh, you can add a little bit of, of minced garlic, not a lot because a lot is toxic. So just, you know, if you're if you're cooking for them, no more than what you would certainly eat. Um, just a tiny bit of minced garlic. Turmeric is a chi mover. That's why it helps pain and inflammation. Um, what are some of the other chi movers that I have? I'm trying to think. I can't come up with any on the top of my head. Kale. Any green 
leafy vegetable is great for the liver element. So kale is good for liver chi. So anything that's good for just tonifying that liver element and getting chi moving is going to help with stress. Okay. But I, I will tell you, now. dogs are really happy right now because we're home mm -hmm. a lot. It's the cats that hate us. The cats are really not enjoying this quarantining at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have another question about celery. Can we use celery for liver chi stagnation? Uh, celery is more damp draining and cooling, so it's not as much of a chi mover, um, and it more cools you off. So if you have a hot dog, it's good to give them celery. If they have infections, it's good to give celery. Um, I'm trying to think of a vegetable, spinach, kale, um, um, kelp is really good for moving chi and kind of draining chi and damp seaweed, but you know who cooks with that? I don't have that in my fridge either. Um, the sprouts, the like watercress and, and um, alfalfa sprouts and those kind of sprouts are really good for liver chi stagnation too. Okay, I think those are all our questions for now. And I do have herbs for liver chi stagnation, so um, trust me, I'm popping quite a few. <laughs> all right, so anything else? I think we're going to end this. Um, I don't, I, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. I can't really see you guys because I'm working on my presentation. I know Lola's kind of keeping up with you guys. I really appreciate you, Lola, being home and doing this on your day off today uh, <laughs> while I'm here at work. Um, I think the next time what we need to talk about is food. I, I, I really think I mean, food is something that everybody feeds their pets. What food should I be feeding my pet? And the answer is it depends, um, because it depends on your pet. It depends on their pattern. But I think you can start picking a little bit healthier choices. And so the next one, and I do have a food presentation. I gave it, what was that, a year or two ago? Um, that was a year. It's a long mm -hmm. one, though. Bear with me. It is a long one. And we're going to go over the patterning. We're going to go over food and what each food does. And we're talking natural food here. You can... Um, kind of translate that to kibble and canned food, but mostly we're talking about chicken as chicken and not as a little brown nugget that says it has chicken in it. We're talking about squash, we're talking about liver, we're talking about mushrooms. Um, we're talking about the actions and the temperature regulation of food. This will go to people too. If you can figure out your element, you can figure out what you need to eat. Um, and that will help you better. I'll give you some resources for you guys to look at um, and you can buy on Amazon some books and stuff. So uh, hopefully next week at Tuesday, 1030, same time, same channel, we'll be talking about food. It's going to be a long one though, so buckle up. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, thanks for joining us. You can us. follow our Facebook. We'll put more events as they come. Also, as you know, we're putting all of these on YouTube and we'll post the link. Um, that way everybody has access and you can go back and watch anything, especially for the food one. I think it'll be important to go over kind of one and two before we do food. All right. Well, I'm going to end the meeting. Farewell. Stay safe. Um, hopefully this will let up soon. If you have any questions, anything at all, please call us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.